I was fascinated by the introduction by William because I didn't realize the group is so broad, as broad as it is. So it really sounds very interesting. Um, these are topics I've been working at and thinking about for, I guess, all my career at the university. I mostly call myself a sociologist of science, but it depends. Could also be philosopher of science. So like Eric, I'm of his kind, I guess. Um, later on, I will explain these little mice hanging on their tails here. Uh, I will get back to them when I get back to the example of the randomized control trial. But first, I would like to introduce my main thesis, which is that people should be as aware of their facts being end products as they should be aware of their food being end products. Even an apple, by the way, this sausage is a vegan one. Um, it has been produced. It consists of many ingredients and this is an end product. And it consists of much labor by many people. And that even holds true for an apple. I happen to have friends who uh, grow apples and in the summer I helped them to pick them and I learn about a lot about apple growing and I start to understand that apples are man-made products. At least the apples we buy in our supermarkets and on the normal market. So an apple is not simply a product of nature, not the ones we know. Strangely enough, Many scientific researchers, I've been working in the social science faculty and mostly among the psychologists, they regard their facts as direct reflections of reality. I guess it's, it's unavoidable, that's how you work. Um, so what I noticed is that they hold the standard view of science, which in my field is called classical realism. It's the view that research if properly conducted, yeah. discovers reality and hence facts reflect reality. Now, the last time philosophers of science seriously tried to defend that thesis was in the 1920s um, by the Wiener Kreis, uh, the Vienna Circle. And one of its main uh, theses was there's knowledge only um, resting only from experience, which rests on what is immediately given. They ran into trouble very quickly because what does it mean that something is immediately given? Um, in a more expressed in a more uh, modern way, immediately given to whom? even what is immediately given among scientists may differ. And if we count in animals like, uh, like dogs or prey birds, uh, to them the things are immediately uh, given in a very diff different way. So this is all very human-centered. And even among humans, what counts as immediately given? Are the stars immediately given to us? That's not what we uh, consider a proper way of studying, um, studying um, celestial bodies uh, in science. We use instruments. Um, so what immediate observation in, in science is depends hugely on man-made and changing instruments. These have been designed. The problem already rose when uh, Anthony van Leeuwenhoek uh, first designed his glasses, his microscope. I read that contemporaries of his asked the question, how can you be so sure your glasses do not distort reality? And I found this picture of him and maybe his wife, so I attribute this question to his wife. Uh, suppose she asked it. It's a very interesting question because how can you be so sure? If we exchange our glasses we see, or, or contacts, we see uh, reality in a different way. So how can he be so sure? You can hardly know. Um, women have always asked these kind of questions 
and there are many cartoons about that available. Um, in addition, who put these name tags up there? There, there are no name tags in the sky saying Uranus, Saturn, uh, Mars, and Earth, and Neptune. That's what human being did. And you probably remember uh, the discussion in the beginning of the 20, 21st century uh, about the issue of Pluto being a planet or not. Now, the interesting thing about this discussion is that, first of all, it was based on facts, but uh, the facts were debated. And um, after the facts were established, it, there was a discussion about whether a certain fact, a certain measurements, uh, pleads uh, for the idea of Pluto being a planet or against. And as you may know, larger audiences are very surprised when I tell them this. As you may know, astronomers decided about this by voting, not by letting the facts tell them whether Pluto is or is not a planet. It's more an issue of whether it should count as a planet. There's nothing wrong with that. There's only something wrong, I argue, with a view of science um, suggesting it can be different. And of course, when you argue for something, you can always be helped by great men. And here's Einstein with his phrase, is the theory and darüber, was man beobachten kann, without a theory when one cannot observe. So we start from a theory, there's no view from nowhere. Hence, we should hear the word fact in its original etymological uh, sense. If you look at dictionaries, then fact, fact, uh, the word fact originally meant action, anything that has been done, a thing done, past principle of factor, uh, which is to do. Does that mean that facts are mere man-made constructions. Um, does that lead us to social constructivism? Well, um, they may be uh, made by people, but they can become very real. The Wister Rep, for instance, is not a man-made, but a woman-made construction, but it became very real. It has been bred because in real life, there are no white rats. But now they are all over the place. So they really, truly do exist. Um, so the present day sociology of science argues that facts are not mere, mere social constructions, but facts in my words are products that produce. Just like sausages and apples, they have been made, there has been, has gone a lot of effort in them, and then they produce our reality, if only because they help to produce our bodies. In a book published in 2014, I expressed this tradition of more realistic realism. We call it realism, uh, but realistic realism in this way. Doing research is not so much a matter of discovering pre-existing paths as a matter of carving out new paths in reality. And I think it's a better way to regard uh, empirical research in this uh, way because it's more honest and it's more democratic. Uh, because if we deny this, if for instance, brain research in the area of psychiatry or whatever area, if brain researchers simply claim, well, we have discovered this, this is, these facts reflect reality, then no debate whatsoever is possible on the facts because the researcher simply speaks on behalf of reality. Um, it's easiest to understand that facts create realities and our designs are products that produce. If you look at technological knowledge, technological knowledge um, clearly shapes reality and its products have been designed by human beings. 
And I, I selected these pictures because they show that um, a car is not a given thing because it can also be designed differently. It's, um, uh, similar for bulb, light bulbs or telephones and even birth control pills because um, there might have been birth control pills that are taken by men. It's a social thing that they do not yet exist and they are in the making. Um, also, these technological products not only sh uh, shape our possibilities, extend our possibilities, but also hugely ch change our social relations. Since the birth control pills, having children is a much more deliberate choice than before. And for your deliberate choices, you are much more res responsible than for what happens to you. So the relationship between parents and children have also been changed by, by, uh, by this technology. And most importantly, apart from material technology, which I just discussed, there is also verbal technology and scientific research. Counting and measuring are based on uh, technologies that also are products that produce. When I used to say that in the social science department where I was working or in other social science departments or also in, in several uh, departments, people would, be, would get truly upset and angry. And then I would give them a very simple example. That's the example of themselves being research subjects, which is when their research output is being assessed mm -hmm. uh, in the context of research evaluation. So one example of verbal technology is the question, what counts as scientific output? Is the answer to this question? Is it uh, quotations? Is it the number of books, the number of papers, the um, citation index of journals, etc. Now, in this context, researchers immediately understand that the, the numbers, the figures, uh, consist of ingredients which they can challenge and discuss. And they also immediately understand that this kind of measurements is a product that produces because there are quite some articles arguing that the definitions of research output uh, change individuals' lives, influence individuals' lives, and also influence societies. If books don't count anymore, that has social consequences as well. So classical realism are, argues facts and values are separated, whereas realistic realism argues facts and values are intensely intertwined. And we should be aware of that. It's not wrong, but we should be aware of that. If a layer of numbers covers up the, the values, they at best disappear from view, but keep on exerting their influence even stronger. Here's one example, a simple example, the example of murder figures. When these kind of examples are dis being discussed in serious television programs, I'm always waiting for the journalist asking, well, what did you count as a murder? Same for poverty figures. Um, for instance, were the uh, victims of war counted in? The war in Ukraine is a very clear example. Um, is Putin murdering people? Um, and in court cases, as you all know, it's not so clear either. Here's a newspaper clipping from the Netherlands. The headline says killed, but no murder. The su Supreme Court changed their criteria for murder. Hence, there's more, more manslaughter now and less punishments. And we can continue with this example. I sometimes have to, I have papers here, so I sometimes lick my finger to get the next paper. Um, some people argue abortion is murder. Now that changes the murder figures. I'm working on a book right now. It's in its finishing phases, a history of 
pregnancy, uh, what classifications do, because the subject of uh, pregnancy is replete with classifications, starting from what counts as an egg in a, in a woman's body, and why is it called an egg, with what consequences. But also, I was discussing the example of murder figures. If abortion is murder, uh, well, here's Mississippi, where are we? If abortion is murder, then the next question is what counts as an abortion? You know, it's a legal question, but it's also a question, uh, it also uh, is important in the context of counting and measuring. Same for Mississippi, a fertilized egg is a person that has a lot of consequences and it has consequences for the number of, uh, of murders for the homicide rates. Um, okay, well, this is simple counting. Um, most, um, a lot of scientific research also consists of experimenting. And there the problem is no different, or it's not a problem. It's something, something we should be aware of. Uh, I guess you all know the randomized controlled trial. Experimental groups are compared with control groups to test a, a treatment, a therapy, a policy, whatever. Um, both the researchers and the research subject are blinded, the, the groups are randomly composed, etc. It's very well known. It is a useful instrument. Uh, there were times when it was, hadn't been designed yet, and heroin, as well as cocaine, for instance, were, came simply on the market and weren't really tested, uh, not tested according to randomized control design. Here is a very nice booklet about heroin being made by Bayer Company as a, as a medicine. And it described how it was initially tested by the company doctor. He simply tested it on sick employees and reported, well, they can go back to work immediately, very quickly. Um, so it's a true asset that the randomized control design has um, has become available, has been made actually, it's a man-made product as well. And its initial background was the telomite scandal, which you may know and otherwise will be remembered of by this simple picture. In 1962, FDA employee Francis Kelsey was honored by President uh, Kennedy because she was, she was suspicious of the product and didn't let it enter the United States. But of course, these kind of things should not depend from a simple one employee. So it's quite an event that in the end, the RCT has been produced, which is, has its own complicated history. And it's not simply a research design, it's a complex social process. Uh, for instance, the European Medicine Agency is involved uh, in it with an 18 levels building in Amsterdam with 1300 desks. So it's quite something. It's, it's an organization. It's a social process as well. Um, but for some reason that I argue because, it's, because people are not aware that this is not a neutral instrument, uh, they attach too much value to it, and um, uh, serious accidents happen with it, which could be, I think, prevented if we were much more aware that the instrument is full of classifications. Why is working at the European Medicines Agency a difficult job? Because the testing of medications is now a complete a um, commercial endeavor. Here you see how listed international contract research organizations, they do this kind of testing. They market themselves to pharma companies with slogans such as driven to service your needs, your journey, our mission, improve your probability of success. And the last one is from Quintiles. And CAO Dennis Gillings of Quintiles argued that um, 
are, are told to Forbes that Quintiles is financially investigating in the medicines while it is testing them, and it helps to market them while it is testing them. That's you can say that openly in Forbes because people think that a randomized controlled trial is a neutral instrument, and uh, the first uh, medicine they did it with was the SSRI, the antidepressant Cymbalta. They, they uh, found out whether it could be simultaneously marketed as a painkiller. And when uh, the answer, when doctors uh, told them that this is a very good idea, uh, Quintal started to invest it into Cymbalta while it was testing it. So that constitutes problems. Here is a famous article by uh, John Ioannidis, and he said the effectiveness of antidepressants is an evidence myth constructed from a thousand randomized trials. That question mark could have been left out because he discusses cherry picking the participants, using favorable statistical tests, publishing only positive outcomes, exaggerating positive outcomes, etc. And for the Bayesians among them, one could add the use of statistical significance testing, which isn't neutral either. Um, now, my main point is a little bit against Ioannidis, even perfectly conducted trials cannot be neutral, and we should be aware of this. And only if we are aware of this, we uh, fully understand that we can not leave these tests to parties with financial interests in the outcomes. Again, the example of uh, antidepressant testant, testing, uh, antidepressants against a talk theory, theory. You all know that uh, the medications, uh, when they are being uh, tested on uh, uh, effectiveness, should be tested on animals first? And have you ever given it a thought on what counts as depression in a mouse or rat, in a rodent? If you start thinking about that, you become aware that this is a matter of classification. What counts as a depression is a very important question. Well, initially, they bred seven generations of the most inactive ones, the most dull ones. Of course, that's a value-laden answer. You can't, you can't, um, you can't um, escape from that. It's impossible to give a neutral answer, but you can, if you are aware of that, you can give it a more your answer a more serious thought. These days, they are. Um, these are uh, transgenics, mice or rats. So they have been made what is called depressed um, by uh, DNA uh, technology. And the fascinating thing to a sociologist like sci uh, of science like me is Sayajan's slogan, we help you discover life. So that's, that's really, um, really something to laugh about because discover life, you, you should think about your work as creating, recreating life. First of all, these animals do not exist in uh, our man-made products. And the next question is, what counts as recovery from depression in a transgenic rodent? Uh, when I started thinking about that, I knew that a son of a friend of mine had rats in his bedroom and I gave him a phone call. He was about 12 at the time. And I asked him, asked him, Anthony, how do you know your rats are happy? He knew, he told me, well, when they happily sleep together. Ah, okay, that's a good classification of not being depressed, being able to sleep pleasantly together. But we both agreed they do not only sleep. So how do you know they are happy when they don't sleep? And he said, when they, when they walk around in my bedroom, okay, that's also a criterion, feeling free to explore its environment. 
Now, these are not the kind of tests that are being used to test the safety and efficacy of antidepressants. They mostly are resilience tests. Here are the mice from my opening slide. This is a tail suspension test. A computer registrates how hard they struggle. It might as well register how, uh, how quiet they keep. That, to me, that would be the sensible, no depressed thing. But the computer measures how hard they struggle, and the harder they struggle, the better the antidepressant. Another one is this one. That's the, here, the four swim test. If you look it up on YouTube, you will see many varieties. And the panic of the animal is uh, immediately translated by the computer in the efficacy of the medication. Uh, so uh, you see swimming, um, um, what is it? Swimming, etc. all kinds of swimming are being measured. Now this is not neutral and this has consequences because only those uh, if the animals do well on these kind of tests, the, the medication, the, uh, the chemical, will, be will, be, will continue in the process. So that only then it will be tested on human beings as well. And in the end, you can see that even in advertisements for antidepressants in doctors' magazines. Here is one from the 1960s. It's for Ritalin that was, has been sold for everything, uh, not only for ADHD. Here it's an antidepressant. And you can see that it actually advertises resilience. It promises resilience. Um, look at the pile of potatoes and before and after treatment. Uh, this is still resilience in working for others. Uh, Present-day antidepressant advertisements in doctors' medicines show resilience in improving oneself and even one's biology. There's often rain on these advertisements suggesting that biology, that nature, can be mastered by taking these pills. Now, uh, you, can't, you cannot nearly drown human beings for testing uh, the antidepressants, so that is being done with the Hamilton Depression Rating Scale, which of course cannot be neutral either. It's full uh, of uh, American neoliberal values, as some critics say. Can brain scans measure depression in a value neutral way? Well, of course, the same issue, what counted. Uh, as depression. So even perfectly conducted trials cannot be neutral and only if governments are aware of that, they will understand that the test should not be directly financed by the producers of, of the medicines. I got um, some few more slides, but I asked Anne Ruth if I, if I have another six minutes, otherwise I skip this part. Of the six minutes is just fine. Go ahead. Please. Okay. Okay. Um, in older research than uh, I, I just discussed, uh, I wrote a couple of articles arguing that the very design cannot be neutral either. It's, we, we, we need it, but we need to know its limitations. And in arguing that, I started out with eminent 19th century methodologists who rejected experimentation with human beings. There are some presentists, awake histories, arguing that these people were not so smart yet and didn't understand research. But of course, the better question is, why did they reject experimentation with human beings? People like John Stuart Mill, Auguste Comte, Kittela, etc. They all argued uh, this is impossible. And you may know that John Stuart Mill, in his system of logic, defended the method of difference uh, as a very good research matter, but he also argued that it's not applicable to human beings. Now, why is it not applicable to human beings, according to him? One of his main examples was the question of 
uh, whether government should interfere into the economy to combat poverty. Was that effective? He argued it's very difficult to give a proper answer to that. And you can't do it with experimentation because if countries uh, differ in this respect, they differ in much more respects. And he even argued that you can't, uh, in an experimental way, establish whether or not a particular chemical heals a particular disease. The method of difference will not help to find the answer. In this case, he argued, why not? Why couldn't Mill think of the solution? Oh yeah, that's because, he argued, that's because people differ too much among, um, people are unique. So why couldn't he think of the solution of the randomized controlled trial, which simply, um, um, singles out individual differences by randomly composing groups and then um, looking for the average difference. Well, that you can find that in the work. The answer is because that's not politically neutral. That's not how they thought about people. They thought, they thought in an organic way about people and uh, as members, members of organic holes. Think of an ant, ant's nest. Now suppose I'm going to do an experiment by randomly picking individual ants from several nests and create new artificial experimental uh, ant control groups of ants. Here is the experimental group and here's the control group. That does not make sense because each ant belongs to its own community. And that's how these people argued about experimentation with human beings as well. Rats also live in colonies. And I used the word rat colony to look for an example. And I got this 20th century, uh, 20th century image, which in my view clearly explains what the problem is with randomly composed groups and looking for averages. Here's a book, beautiful book by Ted Porter, which, you may, which, which some of you may know. He uh, explains how in the 20th century, objectivity became merely mechanical objectivity, uh -huh. while in the 19th century, it could more often also mean judgmental objectivity, but that, now became, later on, became uh, considered to be subjectivity. Well, a randomized controlled trial is a typical example of mechanical objectivity. And uh, I argue that it does make sense, but only if it makes sense to ignore the context uh, individuals are part of, uh, individual differences, people's own stories rather than standardized tests and therapist interpretations. Now, exactly that are the assumptions of talk therapies. So the RCTs necessarily violate um, the assumptions of talk therapies and hence, of course, medicines, medical therapies win in randomized controlled trials. Conclusion. Should the conclusion be scientific knowledge is not objective? I, I think no, that should not be the response because uh, that very view is, is being rejected by my story. So the issue is whether or not a research project is really carefully thought through. And this is what I call, and if you know a better expression, I will be grateful, I call it deliberative precision that is as badly needed as statistical uh, precision. So it's not relativism I am defending here. Actually, I, I think I am more strict on researchers rather than less. And that's because not every fact or food product is as warranted as any other. Thank you.